All right, good afternoon, everybody. We are ready to get started. Thank you so much to all of you who are joining today. I so very much appreciate it. My name is Jennifer Morris and I'm with Madcap Software. Uh, and today we're gonna be taking a look, a, a high level overview of Madcap Flare. So Madcap Flare uh, is part of the entire uh, uh, Madcap software authoring and management uh, ecosystem. And the uh, authoring and management system in Flare is really a collection of platforms that help you author and manage and translate and get collaboration and reviews from subject matter experts, get actionable output analytics. And really it's a collection of all these things that you see here. And at its core are two items here, which is Madcap Flare and Madcap Central. Today, our focus is going to be on Madcap Flare. This is really the backbone to the whole thing. This is gonna be your authoring component that's gonna help you create and manage and maintain that single source of truth um, that, we, that we want to achieve. So that's what our focus is going to be today. Uh, and then in another uh, demo this week, we'll be focusing our attention on Madcap Central, which is a cloud platform that works with Flare. It doesn't replace it, but it works with it. So but today's focus, we're gonna keep keep most of our attention on Madcap Flare. Now, there are really four key reasons why folks use Madcap Flare. When I say folks, I mean individual writers, teams of writers, large and small. Really four key reasons why organizations use Flare for their content management. Oh, and by the way, I'm just going to pause for a second. I do want to remind everybody, I should have done this uh, right when we started. I want to remind everybody there's a question area in the GoToWebinar console. So if you have questions as we go, please feel free to drop them there. I'm going to do my best to get to as many as we can at the end. Whatever we don't get to live, we'll certainly follow up. But please feel free to, to drop questions in there. Uh, and, you know, if something happens, you can't hear me or see my screen, feel free to, to drop a comment in there too. But hopefully you can all hear me okay uh, and that you can see my screen and that everything's sounding good. All right, well, back to our slide here. Really four reasons that I want to cover. Uh, the first reason why organizations standardize on Madcap Flare is really this idea of content reuse. If you're writing content, managing content, uh, technical writer, technical author, content uh, manager, documentarian, whatever you call yourself, oftentimes you have the same procedure or policy or help article or training module strewn, strewn across lots of different manuals and deliverables. People get really tired of updating the same content across all of those different manuals whenever there's a change, particularly to the common bits that often live across all of these different manuals. That's a big thing that Flare addresses is this idea of content reuse. The other one is this idea of publishing to multiple outputs or what we sometimes call multi-channel publishing. You know, if you're always producing PDF manuals, maybe they're put, go, living on SharePoint or an intranet or being shipped to your customers, that's fine. You can still do that with Madcap Flare. Not such a big deal if they were always delivered as one format, but maybe you have to have that content now delivered as something more searchable and navigable online. Maybe it has to be viewed on a mobile device or a tablet, so we have to be mindful of the screen size showing this, so things have to respond appropriately to the smaller real estate. Maybe we have to publish this content to entirely different ecosystems altogether, uh, perhaps ServiceNow, or Salesforce, or Zendesk, for example, or maybe SCORM compliant content, or Tin Can, or XAPI compliant content that needs to live in a learning management system. So that's the other problem that Flare solves. All of the different, all of the content you author can now be published to many of these different channels you need to support, both print and online deliverables. Self-service, improved self-service. I probably don't have to tell you all this, uh, but when you produce searchable and findable documentation and content, it can really help reduce support calls that come into your organization. You help empower users to find the answers they need wherever they need it, on whatever device they're using. They do not have to work as hard to get over the little hump that they've encountered, right, if they're feeling stuck. And when we get out of a print only world, when we start getting content online, well, now we can start gathering really important output metrics. We can start measuring how effective the knowledge base or the help portal or whatever it is we're calling it. How are people searching and using this thing? How are they searching and what are they searching for that's coming back as unanswered? What's some low hanging fruit we can act on to make this content portal so much better? So we can measure these, these um, things without having to be a data scientist or wrangle anything different. We can get instant actionable insights 
uh, into our published content. So that's another big thing. And then also the last thing here is we're trying to keep Flare as flexible and as easy to use as possible so that as content authors, you don't have to be XML programmers in order to achieve all of this functionality. So in terms of that very first content reuse bullet that I just mentioned in the previous slide, I want to do a quick comparison with something familiar to you all, hopefully, maybe you've all used it, which is Microsoft Word. Now I use Word as my example only because it's ubiquitous and a lot of folks have it on their machines, but this could be Google Docs, this could be PowerPoint, this could be uh, um, uh, an HTML editor, this could be lots of things, I'm just kind of going with Word. And what makes Word so easy, or the challenge with using Word for content creation is that what makes it so easy to use are all of the things that get in the way of content reuse. Because when you work in Word, you're doing three things at once that you probably don't even think about. Um, what's happening is, you're number one, you're authoring the content, Number two, you're embedding the formatting. So what do my paragraphs look like? What does the spacing between my bullets look like? And then the last thing you're doing is you're defining the overall scope of the document. And what do I mean by scope? Well, if you're writing a training manual for audience A, it's always a training manual for audience A. If it's a user guide for product A, it's always a user guide for product A. So essentially what the document is gets baked right into it. We have no way of really reusing anything in there. The thing you have to do in Word is if I start with a draft user guide, so in my picture here, I've got this draft user guide, okay, so for a particular product, I might send it around to the team and the team might say, you know what, Jen, that's fantastic, but we need a version of this for the enterprise and the standard version of our product. So in Word, because we have no way of reusing anything, we have to go through this save as exercise. So I'm gonna save it as two copies, Maybe I'll call, call one standard, I'll call one enterprise, and I'm going to make my changes in here. Now, there's obviously going to be some differences between these two. There might be some extra steps that the enterprise customers have to do compared to the standard ones. But, and, but that's okay. But you still got to go in. If something changes to one of these, you still got to go into both of them to the common elements. What if they share step one, two, and three for some procedure? and that procedure changes. You still gotta go into both of those and make that change. So you can probably deal with two versions of your guide, your original draft, but in usually what we see happening, and I wish I could see you, I would say raise your hand if this has happened to you, we actually have to go through this save as exercise more than once. You know, what if we start differentiating, differentiating and, and product management comes to us and say, hey, we need, we need a guide for product A. We need, we're, we're coming out with a new product. There, we need a standard uh, install guide for product A. And what about the enterprise customers? Well, they need their user guide as well for not only for product A and product B. So anytime we need something new, we save it as and we start making our changes. This is a very inefficient way to work. If we distill down to what's happening here, if we operate over here on the right-hand side of the screen all the time, what we're doing is we're hand-touching and hand-editing our end deliverables. And that's what makes this so inefficient. The whole idea of using Madcap Flare and really content management in general is we wanna operate over here on the left-hand side of the screen. We wanna be in a place where if we have to update a procedure, we only want to have to do that in one place. It only exists in one place. Even though it may end up living in 20 different outputs and it might look a little different, that's fine. When it comes time to make that update or edit procedure X, let's say, we're going to do it in one place. So how in the world do we do this? Well, if you think of maybe a manual you've looked at in the past or um, some, some sort of, you know, long you know, PDF, for example, I'll just use that as an example. Maybe it has a bunch of chapters in it. Well, if we just look at chapter three, for example, maybe chapter three is made up of two procedures and two reference sections. The two procedures and the two reference sections is the kind of granularity we're gonna think about when we create content in Flare. We're gonna break those, those, those two procedures and those two reference sections out in Flare and we're gonna call them topics. So topics are really the basis, the little Lego bricks that we're, we're going to be working with and creating. So we got to get out of this long linear start at the beginning right into the end paradigm and we start getting into a topic based authoring paradigm. Now topics, these, these little circles on my, my slide here, these represent our topics. They can be long, they can be short. The length of the topic doesn't necessarily matter. Ideally topics should have some identifiable purpose. They should be about some specific subject and more importantly, they should be able to stand on their own. They shouldn't need a lot of other stuff to make sense. 
So it could be a short heading in a paragraph. Maybe it's a quick little concept. What if it's a, a procedure? It might have a, a heading and a little about this procedure and then 20 steps that somebody has to follow. So it's really long and that's okay. So in my picture here, I've got a bunch of topics. And if I need to make some kind of deliverable, maybe it's a knowledge base, let's say, that just has these highlighted topics here. Well, what I'm going to do in Flare, I'm going to grab these topics. I'm going to stitch them together like little Lego bricks in the order that I want. And I can produce a unique deliverable. What if I have to produce a slightly different deliverable, maybe for a different department or a different customer for whatever reason, or a different product? This deliverable, well, this one needs these topics highlighted here. Well, again, I'm going to grab them, stitch them together, perhaps in a slightly different order, and with a click of a button, produce a new unique deliverable. And sometimes when you go from a linear approach like we do in Word, you start at the beginning, you go to the end, to this topic-based approach, it Flare ends up solving a lot of problems for a lot of people. So by modularizing our content like this, we're not adding any extra work. We're just adding a lot of flexibility on how we reuse this information. But let's take a look at something here. So this general troubleshooting topic, what if we have to go to another level of reuse? So general troubleshooting, this was used in both of these fictitious outputs that I was talking about, okay? so. What if in the second one, there's some information in there that's sensitive, doesn't need to be there for whatever reason? Well, if I was in a Word world or in something else, I'd do that save as exercise, I'd get rid of that content. But in Flare, we can keep general troubleshooting as a single document, and we can let our software take care of customizing that for the deliverable what they need. So in Flare, it takes care of that with a term called single source publishing fancy industry term. Maybe you've heard of it. It means in plain English that if you have content for audience A and a special version for audience B and an entirely different variation for audience C, well, I'm not going to have three versions of that content to maintain. I'm going to put it all, all of my content into a procedure, maybe a single document, and I'm going to let my software do the heavy lifting. So what does it look like? Well, if we could were to compare the Flare single sourcing workflow with the Word workflow, first it would start like this. We would start by creating our master set of source files. So I have a picture here, uh, uh, an example of let's say a getting started procedure. Now I just have text, but of course your topics in Flare can have text and images and videos and tables, all kinds of things. I just have text here to keep it simple. So maybe I'm producing this getting started document and I need to produce maybe some different flavors of it for different uh, customers and maybe different outputs. So maybe as an example, this first paragraph here, uh, this isn't a paragraph for a particular audience. So I don't want to duplicate it. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to mark up this document with what I call some single sourcing magic. In Flare, they're called things like conditional tags and variables. That's going to let us customize our source document. So let's say this opening paragraph here, this is an opening paragraph that I want my standard customers to see. Let's say we have a standard version of our product, they subscribe to it, that's a particular set of eyeballs. When they launch the documentation, I want them to see this. So on a phone or a website, this is what I want them to see. So I'm gonna give it a special color code that says, hey, this paragraph is special, only applies to the standard product in web or phone or tablet, doesn't matter. This next paragraph here, this is an alternate opening paragraph. This one is unique, not only for web-based output, but for my enterprise customer. So it gets a different color code to let me know that it's special. Well, maybe these next two paragraphs here, these are the same for everybody, we're gonna leave them alone. But maybe this last paragraph down here, maybe this is not only unique for my standard customers, but I only want this to show up when we produce maybe a a quick install guide for them, for example. So if content is unique for any reason at all, we can use one of these color codes, which we call conditional tags, to identify it. So looks great for us as authors. We know something special is going on, but we cannot deliver our topics or our output to our end users all marked up with these colors on here. One thing I want to mention is that the topics that we're authoring in Flare, they are raw, neutral XML files. You don't have to know how to spell XML in order to write them or create them, but they are output agnostic. They're not print specific. They're not online specific. They're not learning management specific. They're nothing until we transform them into something. Now, in, in the XML authoring and publishing world, there's all these complicated transforms out there. I call it the XML alphabet soup all the XSLT and all the all those programmatic things that often cost a lot of money if you're 
you know, building these transforms yourself. Well, our end users, our customers, they don't care about all the complex XML alphabet soup. They just want it to look great and they want it to be easy. So in Flare, it's simplified all of that stuff. It has all of the transforms in there for you and they're called publishing targets. It's just a recipe file in Flare that tells Flare, how do we, how do we process these raw neutral XML files so that the output looks great for the audience that we want on the device they're using, etc. So I might create a recipe or a target file for my standard customers. It'll be web-based HTML5, responsive HTML5, I should say. And we can turn a few dials in there. I've just got a couple, but these are the biggies, which is what stays and what goes? Well, we're going to tell that target file, let's include, we want to keep all the standard bits, but let's get rid of anything tagged as enterprise and PDF. Not appropriate, don't want it in there. I might create another target output file called, maybe we call it enterprise. It'll be HTML5, it'll be responsive. It's going to include the enterprise tags, but if we're going to get rid of anything marked as standard or PDF. And then of course I have to create that quick start PDF guide for my standard customer. So it's going to include just the PDF specific bits, the standard content, but I'm going to tell it to get rid of anything marked as enterprise. So if I need a new deliverable at any point, I don't have to duplicate my content if it's already written. I just create a new publishing target and it becomes this publish on demand kind of environment. And then from there, once everything's defined, we can use these target files to generate our outputs. So standard customers, if maybe they access this on a phone, it's all going to respond. They're only going to see the red bits and the common paragraphs here. My enterprise customers, they're only going to see the blue uh, enterprise bits and the common paragraphs and of course my quick start PDF. Only including the, uh, the standard bits, the PDF specific content, and of course those common elements. Now these colors do not show up in our output. They only show up in our source so we know what's happening and what's special. I, put, I only put them in there to show the flow and the continuity of things. So that's kind of big picture in terms of the real world workflow. Working with Flare is often three steps. First, we want to give you the ability to import existing information. We have uh, a number of importers for lots of different file types. So when you start a Flare project, which I'll show you here in a second, uh, you might start it based on a template that has a lot of pretty styles and skins and uh, templates and things that you can change and customize, but you might need to bring in content from something else. And so you can import a lot of things uh, into Flare. I won't go through them all, but probably the most popular, a lot of content starts in Microsoft Word. Flare can import Word docs. Uh, we can see it brings in Confluence pages. Maybe you have engineers that you work with that love Markdown and you want to repurpose that and manage that as a single source. Well, Flare can import Markdown files as well. And then importers for lots of different other uh, uh, help authoring tools as well, like RoboHelp uh, and AuthorIt. So once everything's imported, of course, we can create net new content within Flare, brand new topics, uh, or we can edit some of that information that comes in. And once everything's edited and styled and looking the way we want, well, then we get into the publishing exercise. So again, I won't go through all of these in detail, but probably the most popular ones are going to be direct to PDF uh, and also responsive HTML5. And you can even add some e-learning content in there now, like maybe some interactive uh, quizzes. Uh, maybe some uh, quizzes that are graded at the end of a test, for example, some interactivity there. Uh, and then, of course, we can produce um, SCORM and XAPI zip packages. Maybe you have to take this beautiful HTML5 course you've created and have a learning management system deliver that information. Well, you can do that too. And then, of course, we have some other publishing channels to some other ecosystems like Salesforce Knowledge, uh, Zendesk, uh, Guide, and also ServiceNow. Uh, knowledge bases. So that's kind of the overarching. Now I'm going to put my PowerPoint away for just a bit and I'm going to pull up Flare and we're going to dive in and we're going to take a quick look at the interface. We're going to do some quick edits and then we're going to kind of end with, with building some output so you can see some examples that Flare can produce. Once again, I want to remind everybody, if you joined a little late, please feel free to use that question area in the GoToWebinar console to ask any questions that you have uh, and we'll get to those at the end. All right, so I'm going to put PowerPoint away. I'm going to pull up Flare. So when you first open up Flare, if you've downloaded, I don't know if anybody's downloaded a trial, uh, this is the very first thing you see. We call this the start page. And some folks will breeze right through this and jump right in, and that's fine. But the purpose of this start page is, is to give you quick access to the projects that you're working on. Again, a Flare project is just a collection of all of the XML files and topics you're going to be authoring and to produce many, many different outputs. So I have a few projects here, 
Now, if you don't have a project loaded, you can always use, and I would encourage you to play with this new project wizard button here. So I'm going to start a new project or pretend I'm going to just so you can see. So when you start a new project, you give it a name. By default, it'll throw it in this location for you. You can put it anywhere, though. Um, when I say next, we have a number of built in templates, project templates here. Take the name of them with a grain of salt, but if I select one here, like I'll select uh, top navigation and PDF, you get a little picture, a little description of what it is and a little picture of what the end result might look like. Again, beauty's in the eye of the beholder when it comes to these things. Flare completely separates content from look and feel. The whole purpose of these project templates is to get you started with something. It takes a lot of the heavy lifting out of some really cool design elements for you. So you can use them, customize them, Cut, change colors and logos and fonts, all that fun stuff. They're just here to get you started. So even though this says knowledge base, that doesn't mean you can't use it for uh, a, a, a portal of sorts or a, a documentation that's attached to a software application, uh, for example. So these are built in. I also want to make mention of this here. Uh, and this is actually going to take you to our website. This is really cool. This is kind of a living web page. And so what we do is when we develop and design new project templates, we like to throw them up here. All of these you can preview in their entirety. So if I click this, it, it's just a way to kind of see how they work in action, uh, see if you like the functionality of them. If you like anything, you can download any of these project templates for free and then customize them to, make, to meet your own branding and look and feel requirements. But they're all designed with responsiveness in mind, so they look fantastic on all the different screen sizes one might use to access this information uh, in search and navigate. So this is another good place if you haven't seen this yet. Maybe kind of if something catches your eye, download the template and start with one of those two. So I've already done that. Let me close out of this. I started a project and a couple areas that are important over here on the on the left is the content explorer. This houses all of our topics. All of our little Lego bricks live here. So this particular template project has topics organized in just different folders here just for organizational purposes. You can organize your topics any way you want. They'll always be alphabetized here. Then the other thing I want to point out is every project always has a resources folder. The purpose of this folder is to house supporting content files like images, screenshots you might be using to augment the text on the page, maybe multimedia files or animated GIFs or tutorials that you want to insert. Um, our style sheets, which control the look and feel of our topics, live here. So we try to separate out some of the supporting content files here in the Content Explorer. The project organizer down here, well, this houses all of the gearing of the project. So those, those transform files, those targets, or those recipe files uh, live here. Um, our skins, which are the outer wrappers around our HTML5 outputs that control where our logo is, the search bar, all of those live here. So we try to separate them out. I also have my view customized. I like to have my project organizer and my content explorer sort of split in view right there. The whole layout is customizable uh, here in Flare as well. Now I mentioned, and we're going to take a look at editing a topic here in a moment, but one of the things I mentioned at the beginning is it's, you know, Microsoft Word is, is a pretty common starting point for a lot of folks, and Flare has a fantastic way of getting Word documents in. Um, there's a lot of drag and drop capabilities in Flare, um, not only with content files, but for getting legacy content in, like Microsoft Word documents or FrameMaker documents, things like that. We can actually just click and drag documents into Flare, and Flare will go ahead and import them. So I thought I'd do that for you very quickly so you can see. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and I'll, I'll create a new folder here. I'll call the, my documents all about firewall. So I'll just create a folder fall, called firewalls here. And maybe I have this Word doc and I'll show it to you here so you can kind of see just typical Word doc. I got some, I got some um, sections here. I've got some text and, and image. I've got some tables of data. So this might be something kind of long and linear here. I might want to bring this in so I can manage it as a single source in Flare. So this is my starting point. And all we have to do when we're bringing in Word docs, it has, Flare has a great drag and drop capability for imports. So here's that Word document. I can just click and I can drag it. I'm going to throw all my new topics into this firewalls folder. And I'm just going to say import. Flare's going to go and it's scanning that Word document and it's looking for all of the little bits that it can extract. So here's that doc. I can add additional ones here if I want. I'm just playing with the one to keep it simple. Um, everything that it creates is going to get put into this folder here that I created called firewalls. We can put it anywhere we want. I'm just sticking it in there to keep it tidy. And when I click finish, I'll just roll with all the defaults. I get a little preview of, of, of what's going to happen. And you can see every time you see that HTM file, that's Flare breaking that long linear document 
into individual topics. So you can see that one document yielded quite a number of topics here. So I like what I see. I'll go ahead and say accept. And if I open up my firewalls folder now, you can see I've just brought in that Word document as topics. OK, so now we can manage it in here. So what if we I now you saw me just double click on a file. OK, that's how we get to files to edit uh, in Flare. Let's play with another one. Let me open up this getting started folder and I'm going to double click on this file here called basic steps. One of the things you'll notice is Flare has a multi-document interface, so we can have multiple documents open at the same time, uh, kind of like multiple browser tabs. But I've just loaded this basic steps topic, and it actually it loads in what's called our XML editor. Now, we call it an XML editor, but you don't have to know how to spell XML in order to use it. We wanted to model it after Microsoft Word and keep it very visual. I do have a few optional things turned on here. These are just special markers. You can turn these things on or off if you want. There's one one I've heard one person describe our editor. It's not WYSIWYG or what you see is what you get. It's WYSIOP, which is what you see is one possibility. So if we don't like to have some of those weird markers turned on, we can always come up here and, and we can turn them off if we want to. I'll talk about this gray fuzzy background in a second, but we can start typing like we would in Word. I'll type some words that I don't want to forget to mention today. So I'm just going to type these uh, words here. OK, so just typical typing text. Maybe we need to insert a numbered or a bulleted list. Pretty common in documentation uh, and writing. So I might highlight this information. And just like in Word, I can come up to a ribbon up here. I can make this a bulleted list or a numbered list. I'll go ahead and make it a, a numbered list. We can work with images and multimedia files. A lot of folks need to augment the written word with, with you know, beautiful screenshots, pictures of a user interface, maybe tutorials and things like that. So we can use those. So in my resources folder, if you, if you remember, I said that's where all of our images and multimedia files like to live. So if I open this up, I have my images here. I'll just go ahead and expand it. You can see I have a lot of images in this template project. These are just assets that come with the project. You don't have to keep them in. But if you select an image here, I'll just kind of click on this little guy here. It says FAQs.png. And I do get a little preview of the image. And it's really easy, kind of like dragging Word documents in for the source. We can also do a lot of dragging and dropping with source content once it's in Flare. So if I need to use that image, I can just select and drag it in and it gets inserted into my topic. Now, it looks embedded into this page, but it's actually inserted in here by reference. And why is that a good thing? Well, you might use this FAQs.png image in, I don't know, maybe a hundred different places or a hundred different topics in your project. And what if somebody, now I'm gonna throw marketing under the bus because it's easy to do. I, I hope nobody here is in marketing, but let's say marketing comes along and they say, well, team, we're not using that FAQs.png image anymore. We're using this one over here. We updated it a little bit. You need to update the guides, the training, the help, the portal, the knowledge base. It all has to use this new image. Well, we don't have to go in to hundreds and hundreds of documents and manually swap that out. All we need to do is go to our file explorer, wherever it is. Here's one, let's say this is the new FAQs.png. Okay, so maybe this is on SharePoint or a network drive or some location that I can navigate to. If I click and drag it in here into my images folder and let go, Flare's gonna say, oh, I see you're trying to replace that file. Do you want me to go ahead and do that for you? And when you say yes, it's gonna go and swap out this old FAQ image with the new one in all the hundreds of places where you've used it. You don't have to manually go and change it. So that's why inserting things that by reference like this is a really good idea. That's just a static image. You might be working with multimedia files as well. Uh, if I come up here to this insert menu, we can insert all kinds of multimedia files. So Flare can take in lots of compiled movie formats. So I think in the year 2022, probably HTML5 movies like MP4s are probably pretty popular. I would probably stay away from the old uh, Swift file here, <laughs> but it's certainly there. Um, but you know, if you're using Madcap Mimic or Camtasia or some other tool to create simulations, you might have some of these you want to reuse and you can insert them here. Alternatively, what if you have multimedia files or tutorials up on YouTube or maybe Vimeo? You can just select this option and drop in uh, the URL. And if you say OK, it's going to insert it in as like a little thumbnail here. Now, the, our editor is not going to play it, but when we preview it or we build, this, this, of course, will play.
So kind of basic editing here, just some text and some images, some multimedia. But I do want to talk a little bit about some of the single sourcing power in Flare and how we can really reuse information, which is really at its core. So let's say, as an example, this basic steps topic that we're authoring, let's say we're producing two different versions of this. It's going to live in a, uh, some HTML5 outputs. It might also live in a PDF file. But there might be some things on this page that don't need to be or in one or the other of those outputs. Well, we're not going to have two versions of basic steps to maintain. We can keep it as one and we can use those color coded condition tags that I showed you and mark it up with some variables and some snippets. So we're going to have a little fun. So let's first talk about variables next. So let's see the sentence. It says, here are the basic steps for using FictionSoft. You'll notice FictionSoft is grayed out. It's got a funky background. If I wanted to change the text to something else, I actually can't. If I hover over there, Flare actually gives me a little indicator. It's telling me it's a variable. In fact, it's a product name variable. A variable in Flare is a placeholder for a short string of text. And the benefit to using a variable for these short strings of text is that it gives you a single place to define what that text is going to be project-wide. So variables are great for product names, version numbers, company names, a copyright year, maybe an address, any short string of text that you think is going to change in the future and you're not sure what it's going to be, consider using a variable. In fact, Flare helps us as authors. What if we start typing some content that matches one of these variables? If I start typing something like variables are great when you, oops, I can't type, when you use I just started to type fiction soft and Flare is sort of sensing it saying, oh, I see you're trying to type in one of these reusable objects. Do you want to go ahead and use it? And if I hit enter, it drops in that variable for me. Now, if you find that auto suggestion distracting, you can turn it off. I kind of like it. I like to be kind of reminded that, hey, we've got content to reuse here if we don't remember that we had a product name um, variable, for example. So we might re reference this product in hundreds and hundreds of places, of course. And once again, our friends over in marketing, they may come along and say, well, team, we're not calling the product fiction soft anymore. We're calling it fiction soft enterprise. I don't know if anybody here has gone through a branding change or a product name change in your lifetime. This can create a lot of service for teams of, of, of content authors or worry. <laughs> well, if we're using variables here, which we are, we don't have to go into the hundreds of places or do a complex multi fun and replace to change it. We can just redefine our variable. Now, as much as I love the drag and drop capabilities in Flare, I also love the right click capabilities because I can often find about 95% of the things I want to do simply by right clicking. And getting to my variables happens to be one of them. I just like to right click and do things. It feels very Microsoft Wordish to me. So what I want to do is get to my variables. They happen to live here in our project organizer. But if I want to get to them to make a change, I can just select open variable set. And this takes me to the variables in my project. Okay, if I opened up this folder here, we would see the same thing. But there's that product name variable right there. Right now it says Fiction Soft. Let's say marketing said, I can't remember if we said Fiction Soft Enterprise or Pro. Let's say marketing said it's got to be called Fiction Soft Enterprise. When I save that change, if I go back to basic steps, everywhere I've used that, that variable, now we can see that it's updated. We don't have to go into the files manually and make the change. Now, this is a simple example. I only have this in two spots. But it's a huge time saver when we're referencing these short strings in multiple documents when we've got these changes. Now, what about snippets? Well, snippets are similar to variables. It's another content reuse and single sourcing uh, technique you can use. And they're like variables in that we insert them into our topics by reference like this. The difference, though, is that snippets can be styled. They can contain other variables. They can contain other snippets movies, um, tables of data, they look and they feel and they're edited like full topics, but I like to think of them like subtopics. They don't really fit that mold of standing on their own. They're kind of meant to augment the whole topic and be used in many, many topics. And I'll show you what I mean. Let's go to this uh, folder here. Let me open up this other file here called Getting Started. Let's say as an example, these three procedures here. Let's say these are three procedures we, we use in lots of different topics. Well, I don't want to have to come to getting started and, you know, copy and paste this. Uh, I don't want to have to retype it. Now, these are this is text, but imagine, you know, another great use case for a snippet. Imagine you have warning cautions, notes, you know, these things that you sometimes use a lot over and over again. Those are great things you can create snippets for. So 
my example is pretty simple. I've just got a bulleted procedure list here. So rather than copy and paste it and retype it, I'm just going to highlight all of this information and you can select this UL or you can select multi-select just by dragging your cursor and select it either way. And I'm going to tell Flare I want to create a snippet out of it. So I have a little button here that says create snippet. I have to give it a name. Snippets are their own little separate XML files and by default they like to hang out in that resources folder over there on the left. This is where they're going to go. So we have easy access to them. So once I say create, you can see my content didn't necessarily change, but I cannot edit in here at all. That's because this whole chunk of content is actually coming from that snippet file. What if we need to use this procedure in, an, in another document? Well, what if we go to basic steps, for example? What if that procedure has to live right here for whatever reason? I'm not going to rewrite it. I'm not going to copy and paste. I can go to my resources folder. I can open up that snippets folder. And there's that file that I just created. And kind of like the image, I can just drag and drop it into the topic that I want to use and, re and actually do that anywhere I need to. And again, marketing, apologies if anybody's here. Somebody says, hey, this last bullet changed or we don't need it anymore. You have to rewrite that. Well, again, we don't go into the thousands of places where we've put that information. All we have to do is open our snippet file. I'll double click it here and you can see it looks kind of like a real topic. I'm just going to get rid of this last bullet. Maybe we don't need that anymore, or maybe we need to add one or rewrite something. But we do that edit here in one place in this snippet file. And when I save that change, everybody that's using that snippet, you can see it's updated here. If we go to this file, it's also updated here. So it's a huge time saver for those reusable bits of information that we often have uh, when we're creating and managing content. Before we get to conditions, which is the last single sourcing technique I want to talk about before we do a quick build, um, is I want to point out these um, bars over here on the left. These are called your XML structure bars, um, and, and they're actually patented, so we're kind of proud of them, and they're kind of cool. You, ho you, know, you hover over them, they're blue, which is kind of nice, but we, they actually serve a really important role, and you can turn them on or off if you don't like seeing them. There's a little button down here at the bottom, and if I select it, it says hide block structure bars on the left. You can see they go away. I would encourage, though, if you're new to Flare, keep them on, because what these do is these give us a visual representation of the structure of the document. If you look at a lot of powerful XML editors out there on the market, you might see something that looks a bit like this, sort of this complicated tag view. I would never judge if people like to work this way. I particularly find it a little distracting and hard to see what's going on. I like that visual experience. So what these structure bars do is they're kind of like that happy medium. I don't have to look at a bunch of distracting tags. I can see right away the structure here. I've got a first level heading or an H1. Here's a paragraph. Here I have an ordered list with my list items. That's what LI stands for, the numbered list. Here I have an image. I can see I have a snippet inserted here and my multimedia file. So again, it's it. we don't have to look at a bunch of scary looking tags, but we can still see what the structure is underneath. We can also use these structure bars to manipulate content. If you've ever worked in something like Word, let's say you have to type up a procedure um, it's long and complicated. You've got some indented things happening. And what if you decide, well, shoot, step number three really should be step number two. Well, in Word, what do we do? We highlight step number three. We do a cut or we do control X on our keyboard. We put our cursor where it's supposed to go. We say a few prayers and we wonder what Word is going to do to that numbering that we've set up. You often spend a lot of times kind of fixing the numbering scheme in Word when you do that. Well, we're not going to run into that problem in filler because we're moving things structurally. So if I need three to be two, I can just click this item, move it up. When I let go, I can see that step number three has become step number two and all of my numbering is self-healed. So <clears throat> really powerful when we're dealing with numbered lists. Any of these elements can be moved up or down if you want. So wherever that you see that blue arrow, that's Flare telling you, yes, it's legally valid for you to put me there. Now, what if we wanted to kind of customize this basic steps topic a little bit? Remember I said we need to produce an online and a print version, and there might be some things that need to stay or go. Well, that's where those condition tags come in. So let's say as an example, the word basic here, maybe the word basic is only applicable to my PDF deliverable. So I'm going to right click on the word and I'm going to pull up my condition tags just by right clicking. Again, there's my friend, the right click menu, getting me right to where I need to go. Now, this is a template project, so it only had a couple of condition tags here. 
But when you're working in Flare, you can create any number of condition tags you want. You can call them whatever you want, and you can give them whatever color you want. I'm just using what's been given to me here. So I'm going to say, you know, the word basic, it's only for my PDF output. So I'll check that box. I'll say OK. And there's that little color code to let me know that it's special. Maybe step number two is only for my PDF guide. Same thing. I'm going to say, well, that's information is special. I'm going to give that my PDF only tag as well. What about our multimedia file down here? Right, so this is great for our online deliverables, but if we're sending our, if people are going to be printing out their manuals as PDF, you know, a YouTube video or, or multi, that doesn't do anybody any good, right, in a print-based manual. So maybe I right click and I say, well, this is only for my online deliverables. Okay, so now we can see my content here, it's lighting up like a rainbow. We got some special stuff going on. One of the things you can do when you're authoring in Flare is you don't have to build everything to spot check and see how these tags are respected. Flare actually gives you a little preview here where we could preview our topics, topic by topic, using the different outputs or targets that we have on our project. So it's like a quick compile. We're not looking at everything that's in, in its entirety. We're just looking at this page we're working on. So maybe I want to preview this and see, well, how is this going to look? in my HTML5 output. How would it look in the web browser? Now we're not seeing everything here. We're just looking at some content. The preview shows about 98% of everything that we would see on the output. But some important things are those condition tags. So you can see here on the left, this is my source, this is my output. The word basic is gone, even though it's here in my source. Also, we, we told it conditions, this is for print only deliverables, not online. So step number two is gone, but Flare is also smart enough for these numbers to be self-healing. We're not left with anything out of sorts just because we removed something in the middle there. And then of course, we've got our, our YouTube video thumbnail link there. What about our PDF? Let's take a look at that. It's gonna look a little bit different. It's gonna take on some different style properties. And we'll also notice, let me make this a little bit bigger so you can see. The word basic is there, right? Because we said, hey, that stays for PDF. Step number two is there. But if we scroll down, we can see our movie is gone because we said that was for online only. So really simple example, but really powerful when we're creating many different you know, flavors of our, of our source content. So hopefully you're thinking about some ways you can perhaps use some of these color-coded condition tags and keep our documents as a single source this way. So a little bit on the editing side, let's transition a little bit and let's talk about building some output now. We've been playing with our source material. We did a quick import to see how we can repurpose existing information quickly. We've done some, some styling changes and some single sourcing. I want to I kind of pull this together and show you some outputs. So for that, couple things. Down here in the project organizer, uh, I mentioned, you know, some of the project gearing is stored here. Well, those target files live here. There's another file that's really important in our Flare project, and that's called the TOC, or the Table of Contents file. Now, the Table of Contents file, I'm going to double click and open this one up here and show you. It's one's called Online Output. The Table of Contents file plays a really important role. This is the file that allows us to stitch together and order the topics that we want for our end users to see. The Content Explorer, our end users never see this view. They never see this organization. This is only for us as authors to manage content. Everything lives here alphabetically. So if you move what's new to links and lists, it's gonna probably, it's gonna be under this list. We can't put it like here because that's not the purpose of the Content Explorer. But the TOC is what we can use to stitch and order things together here. So if I want what's new to be number one under getting started, I might just click and drag that up. I can put it wherever I want. I can drag it or I can use these little buttons up here in the toolbar if I really want to be precise. So this is what we use to organize what our end users are going to see. It's kind of like an outline. So once we've built this table of contents out, oh, let me do this. I forgot. We, we imported some topics. What if we need to bring some of these topics in? Well, I, if you recall, I created these topics as a result of that word import. What if I need to use that? Well, I love the drag and drop. We can put these things anywhere we want. Perhaps application gateways goes, I don't know, here for whatever reason. <laughs> so we can put these where we want. This is where that stitching of the Lego bricks comes together. Right now that we've got some organization, let's transition a little bit and talk about building something. So that's where those target files come into play. So my project has online and print based targets in different folders just for organization. So I'm going to just open up one of these here. 
so we can see some of the settings. I'll just choose top navigation. Now I'm not going to go through every tab, don't worry, but I want to touch on some of the biggies here. First off, what are we making? I can see here that this target is already set to HTML5, but if we were to add a new target, this is where we would actually tell Flare what is it that we would like to make. Table of contents, this is where we tell the target what TOC or order of topics are we going to include? It's not uncommon to have more than one TOC or table of contents in your project because the different outputs you produce might have a slightly different order of things. So I'll choose online output here. Conditional text, this is where we tell the target, okay, what stays and what goes? We've already got our online tag set to include. We can see it's explicitly set here. My PDF is set to exclude, and I do want to point out when we exclude content for online or any of our deliverables, really, Flare is not hiding them with any kind of CSS smoke and mirrors. It's actually physically being removed. So if you're publishing some sensitive information online and you tell Flare, hey, exclude these tags, you won't run the risk of somebody viewing the page source, for example, and splunking around and finding something they shouldn't. It's actually gone from, from the output. So our conditional tags are set. The last thing I might do is come down to this analytics tab here. Now I have a Madcap Central trial uh, that I've used. And what I, what I did already is, is as long as you have a central trial, and we don't have time to go into this today, we'll spend a little bit more time on this on the central demo. If you have a central account, you can log into it, which I did, and you can create something called an analytic key. So I already did that. I created one, I just called create. Uh, click the create button. I gave it a name, product A, for example. And so what I'm doing is I'm telling Flare and Central, well, mainly Central, that I want to watch how people are searching and using this thing so we can get some great analytics on it. So that's the last step. I'm going to click build. Now, you don't have to host your content on Central. You can still publish these things to your end user's machines. I'm publishing this locally on my machine here. We'll still get analytics on this target. Uh, you might publish them to your end user servers. You might publish them to your own lockdown web servers. That's totally fine. Uh, you can host your output anywhere. You can still use central as your dashboard into all of the data. So I'm going to also build two other targets. I'm going to just right click. I'm going to build the side navigation one and we're going to and I'm also going to build this PDF. So we're going to build three different outputs all pulling from the same set of source files and they might have the, they'll all look a little bit different. So let's double click on this one. It's done. This is called top navigation. This is HTML5 and it's called top navigation because we have our TOC across the top. Now I'm using a built in skin uh, for this. So please, again, take the look and feel with a grain of salt. Nothing is set in stone. You know, if you were to use this skin, you could change out the logo, the spacing, the blue. All of this stuff is customizable. I'm just using out of the box, no customizations at all. So this is how we could navigate through our TOC. There's that about firewalls topic that we dropped in. Uh, let's see, here's basic steps with our conditional text. You can see things are removed here, but there's that handy little YouTube we dropped in there. Um, this is fully searchable. So if I were to search for something like topic, okay, so I get a kind of these googly style results. What do people do when we get stuck in the real world? We go to Google and we search. And so we wanted to model that search experience after something very familiar. Um, let's do a search for uh, conditions. Um, and I'll show you, we also support um, something called micro content. Micro content is text, images, video, sometimes a combination of these things. And we can create these different phrases that pair to a single response so that we can create this sort of promoted, curated experience for our end users. They don't have to wade through so much stuff. The whole idea with micro content is that we give them a little information that they can read and watch in about 10 or 30 seconds and find the answer to their question. It's very similar to what Google does. You've seen micro content when you've searched in Google. You probably did it five minutes before you jumped in this webinar today. You know, you did a Google search, you got like 10 million hits. But at the very top, you got this little promoted thing of, of information. Sometimes it's step one, two, and three, and a picture, uh, sometimes it's just a bunch of drop downs, what other people ask, that's micro content. And we're replicating the same thing here in Flare. So we can produce these little promoted answers that prevents folks from having to wade through a whole bunch of stuff to try and find what they need. So let's click around here a little bit and hopefully by the end we'll have some analytics to show if we have some time. I'm gonna do some more searches here so we can see. And I'm gonna pur purposefully, uh, let's see if I can search for Madcap. Nothing. I'm searching. I did this on purpose because I'm hoping we'll see some data show up before we wrap today. It can take a few minutes. 
Um, all right, so I've done some searches here. Let's take a look at some of the other outputs we made. Let's open up this side navigation one. So this is the same thing, except we call this HTML5 side navigation. So everything's sort of tilted on the left. Here's that same navigation just over here, okay? Fully searchable as well. Now I'm not tracking analytics on this one, that's okay. But we get our search results here. And by the way, I did wanna point out, these are fully responsive. So look how, you know, this looks fantastic on a, on a website. You know, all these little drop downs, everything kind of strewn across the side here. If we were to access the same thing on a phone, let me shrink this down. We can see that everything responded appropriately. Notice that my table of contents went away. I got this handy little hamburger menu that I could tap through on my phone, for example. OK, maybe um, we scroll down, we can see these tiles stacked appropriately on the page. You know, we're not using our thumb and our index finger to navigate around and scrunch around to see what we need. So fully responsive out of the box. OK, let's take a look at this. I'm just going to I just built a stock PDF here. And again, you'll have to take this look and feel with a grain of salt. Here's my PDF user guide has all of our topics stitched together, slightly different ones because it was using a TOC. But let's look at basic steps. There's that one we were working on together. Of course, those the print based tags, they're there. But notice that my YouTube video is gone because we said, hey, don't include it in there. Now, again, this is just stock stuff. OK, so beauty's in the eye of the beholder. What I thought I'd do, too, before we take a look at some output analytics. As I brought up, let me open up my web browser one more time. I brought up some existing real life examples of what other companies are doing and how you're able to really see the power of separating content from look and feel, um, which is which is huge. We want to maintain our corporate brand uh, when when folks go to our portals. Right. So here's a here's one. And now I can only show you what's publicly facing. Right. I can't show you anything that's private. So I've just pulled a handful of, of, of publicly facing portals where, where Flare is used to create and manage and publish the whole set of content. So here's a company called Fitbit. Maybe you heard of them. Wearable technology. They use Flare for all of their online and print based uh, documentation. Here's an example of a, of a Flare output. So you can see it's it's styled and looks the way they want. They've actually translated this into multiple languages. Full translation and localization is supported in Flare. Um, they make heavy use of this fun drop down effect, for example, but it looks very branded. It's hard to tell when you if you were to go to the Fitbit site and come to this page, it feels very seamless. So they make use of sort of these procedures. They have some really cool like 3D animation here, which is kind of fun. Um, so that's pretty neat. Um, here's another one big company called Tibco. So they go with that more of that side nav look. So everything's, you know, styled and looks the way they want from their, um, for their corporate branding requirements. So they went with that TOC kind of tilted down the left and everything organized this way. So it looks a little different, right? They're using the fun little back to top button here, which you can do. Uh, here's an organization that went with more of the top nav look where they, they took one of our basic skins and they've customized it to make, make it look the way they want. So they had that top nav, here's their TOC more of like a like an API uh, kind of uh, content. So you, when you get into it, you can see, of course, it looks very different, but it meets their corporate styling and branding requirements. Um, here's a really interesting one. This one's kind of cool. This doesn't have any kind of search or navigation at all, but they make these interesting mount products for television. So, you know, they went kind of with this tabbed approach, which is kind of neat, right? And then you can go into each series and then you get a lot of information. So again, very customized to meet their own uh, requirements. Okay, so this is probably a snippet. <laughs> Warnings, cautions, notes, we use those all the time. Um, here's a, a stylized PDF. This is a company that makes these kites, uh, these, these controls, these little consoles here. Um, but again, their layouts look very different from what you just saw. Here's their dynamically generated table of contents, their own pagination, etc. So as you can see, you can really make these things look the way you want. I always say it, I'll say it again, that beauty's in the eye of the beholder when it comes to Flare content. Um, all right, checking my time. I just want to show you a couple things here. Now, this is Madcap Central. We're going to spend a little bit of time on this on the Central demo. But here I am in my Central trial. I came to this Analytics tab. I do want to point out that each of these rows represents different targets from different projects that I'm tracking. OK, so they're all different output, different people hitting it. This is the one I just created. OK, and I don't know if there's going to be. Oh, it was pretty quick. So phrases. Now, I'm the only one 
hitting that site, if you remember. So the only data we're going to see here is me. So it won't be as interesting as if you had hundreds and thousands and millions of people hitting your documentation. But the point of these analytics is that we can see the successful searches that are done right away. No scripting, no data scientists. It's instant and we can use it and act on it as authors. Phrases, these are the successful searches that people do. How many times was that search term used? Okay, so it was used three times since it's gone live. How many results were offered? you know, in those in the long list of hits and whether micro content was offered as a result. You can see a micro content was offered as a result when I did a search for conditions, even though I got four hits here. Now, phrases with no results. This is the money report, in my opinion. Now, I only did that twice, if you remember. I searched for Madcap twice and it came up with nothing. <laughs> Um, so this is the one you really want to pay attention to. If we can take care of this really low-hanging fruit, we know exactly what people are looking for and we know what they can't find. So if they can't find it in our portal, they're probably opening up a tech support case. And not that you don't want to talk to your customers, but that, those, the human element of technical support costs a lot more than these products per year. So you can really start making a difference on the bottom line when we start getting into topic deflection. Um, for the rest of these, since I'm the only one using it, it's not very interesting. Let me look at another knowledge base that I'm tracking here and we can kind of see. Uh, topics. Topics represent the hits that people do. So this is a great report to pay attention to. These are the topics that are visited in your, visited in your output. So you, you know, take a look. You can sort by view counts here. These are the topics you want to pay attention to and keep up to date. They're clearly important to your readers. If you are in the camp of taking your documentation and contextually linking it to an application, whether it's desktop or web-based, well, we can run this context-sensitive help report. If you're using the context-sensitive help method in Flare, we can actually see where in the application people are getting stuck and calling for help. We, we're going to know where ID 1001 is going in, into the application. Why is everybody getting stuck there and calling for help? Maybe we don't have a doc problem on our hands. Maybe we have a UX problem on our hands. It helps you come to the table armed with good information uh, when you're talking to the developers. And again, browser stats, operating system stats, what browsers are being used to hit everything. When we, if we didn't think we needed to have a responsive content strategy, we might pop over here and notice, gosh, our viewership among you know uh, mobile phones, these browsers running on the mobile phones, it's growing. We should make sure everything's looking great. Same thing with operating system stats. What operating systems are people using to hit our site? So we'll spend a little bit more time on these on the central demo and we'll take a look at it again. But we can see how quick and easy it is to get this data. All we need is a central account. We don't need to host it there. We can publish it anywhere uh, in order to get the data. All right, so I'm looking at my time. I've got four minutes left. I do want to take a couple questions here, but I do have something I'd like to just share with everybody. Um, I want to remind everybody here there is a limited time offer. So for, uh, I, I don't know when it's going to end, but for a very limited time, if you purchase um, a three-year subscription to Flare on its own or AMS, or even Madcap Central a la carte, um, then you're going to get an additional three months free on your subscription. And as attending today, um, and, and you'll be able to contact sales or go to our, our website to contact us, uh, attendees to this session get an extra 10% off their purchase when you purchase by the end of May. So contact your sales rep or just email sales at madcapsoftware.com, sales at madcapsoftware.com, and your sales rep will provi uh, provide you a quote if you need something for, um, you know, to present or you need just some pricing information, they're happy to help with that. Also, real quick, um, there is, I, I want to remind everybody, if you're new to Flare, you're thinking about it, um, I would invite you to attend our introductory training. It's live and instructor-led. We offer it a few times per month. It's $600 of training you get for free, and it's an all-day class. It's a fantastic way to kind of see what we talked about today in a little bit more detail, very hands-on, um, and I would invite you to attend this if you'd like. You can sign up right on our website. You can see all the modules that we cover. Pick the date you want and sign up for free. It's a fantastic way to get up to speed very, very quickly with your first Flare project. So if you haven't already taken this, I encourage you to take it, and it's live and instructor-led. And then the last thing before we get to some questions, I want to remind everybody about our Mad World User Conference. It's happening June 12th through the 15th in Austin. Um, we are we still have um, openings. You can register on our website. Fantastic lineup of speakers and presentations. Um, we, we also offer it virtually this year. It's the first time we're doing it. So if you can't attend in person, you can attend the main conference virtually. So feel free to pop on over to our website uh, and learn more about that. Um, okay, and our last couple minutes, I'm just throwing my email up here. I'm be 
delighted if you connect with me or send me a note, send any feedback or questions my way. I'd be happy to help you. Um, a couple questions came in, um, and I'll repeat them for everybody. Would inputting a hyperlink be a condition? Um, not necessarily. You could insert a hyperlink into your topic that links your reader either to another topic in your output or an external website or PDF altogether. That's certainly supported in Flare. So a hyperlink and a condition would be two different things. But I will mention you might need to put a condition tag onto a hyperlink. Um, so, so sort of the answer is, you know, the answer is no, it's not a condition, but hyperlinks are different. You certainly could put a condition tag on the link if it needs to be excluded from a particular uh, output, for example. Another great question came in. How does the font style change from what you are seeing in Flare to your PDF? Ah, well, Flare, as I said, Flare uh, topics, the look and the, the content itself we see on the page is separate from the look and feel. So Flare topics take their orders from something called a CSS or a cascading style sheet. Flare conforms to the CSS 1, 2, and 3 specifications. So the reason why it looked different in the PDF is because in my single style sheet, I set style properties on the heading. I said, hey, when we go online, I want my first level headings to look like this. When we go to print, I want my first level headings to look a little different. So it allows us to single source our style sheets too. So we can control the look and feel of all of our topics using that CSS file. We don't have to go into our individual topics and make style changes. We always want to do it in our style sheet. So we, I didn't have time to show it today, but there is um, a, a really easy to use CSS editor in Flare, a UI. You don't have to know how to code CSS. If, of course, if you want to, you can, but you don't have to. Um, somebody might write a CSS for you. You could plop it in your project and use that if you wanted, or you can use the user interface to style your um, your headings and your paragraphs and things like that. How is another great question came in? How is SME review and sign off conducted? Well, that sort of can come into play. We have two integrated ways. One is um, with a tool called Madcap Contributor, which is a desktop installed tool. Another integrated way is using Madcap Central, and we're going to touch on that in the Central demo tomorrow afternoon. So I would encourage you to come to that if you want to see that. We're going to actually run through a, a, a review iteration and a review lifecycle so you can see how we can fold in subject matter experts into the whole review uh, and content uh, collaboration process. Process. Um, and, and that's all done online. Uh, the Central's uh, web-based review is done online. I mean, of course, you could always generate a Word doc or a PDF file and send that around, no problem. The difference is, though, that it, the, the changes and the edits people make are not um, integrated back into our source. We'd have to kind of manually get those, those text changes back into our topics. So there's nothing wrong with gen generating a Word doc for sending around to review or a full PDF, no problem. But just keep in mind that we have to we have to get those changes and those comments back into our source. Using Madcap Contributor and Central is a way to do that in a more integrated fashion and in a bit more automated way. Um, so great. Well, I'm glad that this was helpful. I'm looking at my time here, and I've gone a minute over. I apologize. Um, I really hope everybody enjoyed this presentation. Would be Like I said, I'd be delighted if you'd send me an email with any further questions. Um, that you have uh, or uh, comments or feedback or anything like that, we'd be happy to help. And do get in touch with your sales rep if you have any questions about the current promotions. I hope to see you on the next central demo that we're doing or perhaps another uh, Q&A session or perhaps in our uh, free, tra uh, free training class. I'm teaching that uh, this Thursday if you'd like to join. So I want to thank everybody for coming today. I hope you have a good rest of the day and we hope to see you on another presentation. Thank you so much. Have a good one.